it is so nice to see you. I wanted to greet you with many moons have passed without a word between us. <laughs> even though we've never spoken before, but that's one of the lines from Elfquest that has stayed with me through all these years. And I just love your writing and your art. And I feel blessed and honored to have you on my show today. So thank you so much for taking time and honoring me with your presence. And I already see your glowing light and it makes me happy. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to meet you and you have a glow about you too. And is that a Halloween pumpkin behind you or just? Uh, this one here, this is my yeah. uh, my salt lamp, <laughs> the, the pink salt lamp. You got to have as much good energy in the air as possible, you know. I agree with that. <laughs> we have uh, salt lamps down in our uh, living room and around the fireplace. We have large blocks of rose quartz. It's uh, It's lovely to have that in the living area. It is. It's just nice to be surrounded with something like that, something from nature, you know, that's not necessarily a plant, I guess, but although I do love plants. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to waste any of our time. So I'll give you a quick little intro and then we can get started. Does that sound okay? Sounds perfect. Hey guys, how's it going? Michael Troy here. I am super excited to bring you this show today. This woman needs no introduction, but I am going to give her one anyway. Um, she is the creator of ElfQuest, along with her amazing husband, Richard Peeney. Um, ElfQuest, arguably one of the most important independent comic books of our lifetime. Uh, an amazing artist and a wonderful spirit and beautiful person. I'm so happy. Thank you so much for being here, Wendy. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I've seen your uh, other charming videos uh, about my collaboration with John Byrne, and you sounded like someone who would be a lot of fun to talk to. <laughs> well, on my show, my channel is mostly like, um, it's funny because I started my show at the beginning of the, uh, the lockdown. Um, I had been wanting to do a comic book related channel. Um, and a lot of it, my, I have tons of old comic books in my dad's attic in Ohio. I, I live in West Hollywood now. So my Ooh. sister's been sending them to me and I've been doing videos where I just look over it. It's mostly art critiques because I'm an artist myself. So I love uh -huh. to look at the art and, um, the nostalgia and the love for comics just return to me. So, um, but I know a lot of creators and, you know, or I'm friendly with them and I love to talk about the process. And, you know, as an artist yes. growing up, I've always loved to read interviews with artists to be inspired. So I kind of wanted to give some of that back by, uh, you know, picking the brains of some of my favorite artists and being able to talk to them about their process and things like well, that. That's one of my favorite types of conversations because it's, it's not often during an interview that the conversation goes in that direction. Uh, most often um, uh, interviewers are non-artists and, and so they don't necessarily have the language to talk about uh, why something looks the way it does or what choices were made or what materials were used and that sort of thing. Um, I think ElfQuest was probably like my first independent comic book. I remember um, after my parents got divorced, we moved to Vegas and then my mom got remarried and my stepdad uh, started taking us to comic book stores and I had never been to one. Oh. Um, you know, most of my comic books came from 7-Eleven or recycled mm -hmm. from the girl down the street. And, Mine um, came from Safeway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for that. I miss uh, being able to go to the grocery store and read comic books while uh, while somebody shops. <laughs> but um, so seeing ElfQuest for the first time is like really blew my mind. Like, you know, because I, I, I think art was the main thing that drew me to comic books. But I really loved the format of ElfQuest because it was like in the magazine, you know, size. And then it had these beautiful painted covers. And my favorite part were the portraits on the back. I just mm. adored those. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, it seemed like such smart packaging at the time, because especially a black and white comic book is probably a tougher sell. So did uh, uh, the size or those uh, flourishes, like the painted covers and the painted back piece, what inspired you to sort of package it like that? Um, 
There were very, very few independent comics at the time we got started in 1977. And one in particular was our role model. Uh, that was Jack Katz's First Kingdom. It was magazine size, printed on newsprint in black and white, and he had elaborate colored covers. And I don't quite remember if he did portraits of characters on the back covers. I think that was an idea that Richard and I had because we wanted people to keep the characters straight. We, we had a lot, we had a large cast, let's put it that way. And so we, we wanted people to get to know the individual characters and what they looked like. And, and uh, the back cover portraits helped to reinforce that. Um, you know, it was, we didn't have ads or anything like that. So we had an empty back cover and we had to put something there. <laughs> They're so beautiful. They just really are. And fortunately, um, I had started, uh, I was introduced to ElfQuest, I think pretty much when all the issues were available, if not um, all of them. So I was able to like, voraciously collect them um you know all at once without having to wait so there was that was a good thing for me and it's funny because then i moved back to ohio after my mom got divorced again and oh. um discovered the star blaze editions where i'm seeing my beloved elf quest in this brilliant cover color for the first yes. time on this gorgeous stock and um it's funny because like it blew my mind at the time but now, like looking back at it, I guess because my artistic interests and tastes have changed and matured, it's like I kind of prefer the black and white versions because I, I just it's so beautiful what you did. Like it's I was thinking like, especially I mean, I hate to put gender in there, but it's like, you know, you really did not hold back in ElfQuest. Like it, it's like the action is there, the you know, the necessary violence is there. Just yes. the, you depicted everything just so, I don't know, viscerally and, and beautifully yeah. at the same time. And um, I, in preparation for this, I, I watched a couple of interviews with you. And um, one of my favorites was the Mike Avila. Um, I love his interviews um, <laughs> for sci-fi. And you had mentioned, first of all, uh, having pictures of elves that you drew when you were two years old. yes. Absolutely. Which, which speaks to me, the cosmic, like, um, fate of, like, you were born to make ElfQuest in a way. I mean, are those available online anywhere? I would so love to see those in, pictures. In the book, uh, in my husband's beautiful book, uh, uh, The Line of Beauty, The Art of Wendy Peeney, uh, the my two-year-old drawings of elves are uh, featured. No. on a page so I we have wait to find actual this. published proof that that happened yes wow <laughs> um, and so um, I was adopted and my adoptive parents named me Wendy and when uh, I was named after the Wendy and Peter Pan wow uh, and uh, the name Wendy, if you if you look it up in in you know how you can look up the meaning of names in certain places, the name Wendy means elfin wanderer. So wow. I was I was kind of doomed <laughs> <laughs> from the very beginning to go on a fae path. <laughs> it, it was your destiny. It was yes. your destiny. So aside from that drawing, uh, did your love of elves? I mean, was was it always there? Did it, I mean, is this completely yes. organic? Yeah. I've oh, always oh, loved yeah. elves too. I mean, come yeah. on, is is Lego less not the not the most attractive uh, uh, character from? Uh, well, Lord he's of not the, Rings. the most attractive <laughs> elf. I think Cutter is, but <laughs> oh, absolutely. I meant from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I know, I I know. I was just joking. Um, I think that what it's all about for me and has been all my life is otherness. I've always had a sense of just being kind of different mm -hmm. uh, and and in a number of ways. And I never could put my finger on it, but I know what I identified with from the time I was a very young child. And it would be 
fairy creatures, uh, creatures that I saw in Disney cartoons, um, Tinkerbell, Peter Pan, you know, I would see them and I would say, that's me. And then as, as my ability to draw improved, I would create family for myself. I would create cardboard dolls of characters that I made up in my mind and um, have them around me in my room because I just wanted to be surrounded by what I considered to be my people. So it's, it, it's <laughs> funny you should say that Putter is the most attractive elf because I 100% agree. Oh, um, <laughs> it's funny because as a little toehead blonde boy, uh, you know, reading Elf mm-hmm. Quest, it's like as you get older, you do, I realize the you know the importance of inclusion because I know it meant the world to me to see this, you know, blue eyed blonde elf um you know just uh, i i i've always loved him and it's funny well more than that yeah more than that he's androgynous Mm -hmm. you know you know there's more to him than just a little macho male he's uh he's he's most definitely got a feminine side as well I know, because now I look back at it and I'm like, because they were so beloved to me and I didn't think of them in that way at all, you know, as a child. But now I yeah. look at them and I'm like, wow, they're kind of hot. I'm like, and <laughs> and let's <laughs> and let's not discount Rayek because he's got it going on too. Oh, I mean, I know. <laughs> Talk so, about a hottie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, you also talked about, I was also blown away by, um, by the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, two of your biggest influences were Jack Kirby and Tezeku. I'm sorry, I'm going to oh, screw oh, up his Osama name. Tezuka. Yes. And I thought, and the way you explained it, it was just so, and I see it all now, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um I had watched an interview not too long ago with Bill Sankavich and, you know, he was talking about finding your artistic style. And he said, in a lot of ways, he himself wanted to be an amalgamation of like all of his favorite artists. And I think in a way as an artist, it's impossible not to do that. You know what I mean? Cause you're always picking up something from someone else. Like what comic book artists worth their salt doesn't use Kirby crackle. You know what I mean? It's like... A lot of them do. Um, <laughs> I also think that in the medium of comics, you want to land on a style that you're known for. And uh, if your style is an amalgam of influences, you want to codify that into something that people can look at your work and say, oh, that's Bill Sienkiewicz. Oh, that's John Byrne. Oh, that's Wendy Peeney. You want, you want something that is specifically yours even if it reflects influences and, and you want it to be consistent, you, you, you know, because comics is a constantly repeating, you know, make those deadlines and your work keeps coming out month after month after, after month, you, you want people to feel like they can trust that they're, they're always going to see their characters looking the way they expect them to. Um, that can backfire in the sense that when we have wanted to work with other artists, um, there, there has been some backlash from ElfQuest fandom because there's, there's a whole section of ElfQuest fandom that's really not satisfied unless I draw the characters. <laughs> and, you know, deadlines being what they are, uh, sometimes I have needed help over the years and have you know, worked with other artists that we felt could really get the characters very closely on model. But in some cases, it didn't satisfy the fans. So (laughs) so being known for a style uh, can also sort of, uh, what do they call it in Hollywood, typecast you, you know? Yes, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm a little guilty of that in a sense. one thing I did want to say, I thought it was interesting that Kirby was a big influence on you because I, oh, yeah. your your ink is so like beautiful and your brushwork is so precise. I thought there's a little bit of jokes in it in there too, I bet. How Kirby was inked was always fascinating to me. I, I, I could tell when he was working, like, well, Joe was the ultimate Kirby inker, but there were also others, uh, you know, um, 
I think uh, his least favorite was Vince Coletta uh, because Vinny brought, you know, a, a kind of unexpected cross-hatching technique to Kirby's art. And, and I think Jack maybe felt it make, made his work look less strong. Joe just stuck to Jack's pencils and, and just enhanced the strength of Jack's pencils. Um, and uh, okay, I, lo I lost the train there. Where were you going with that? Oh, I was gonna say, so um, uh, when, uh, when you did Sage at Blue Mountain and Joe Staten took over as the oh, anger, Joe Staten, yes. at, at first I didn't like it at all because I, I was like, oh God, this isn't Wendy inking her stuff and it looks really different. But then mm -hmm. re revisiting it now, like I have a new appreciation for it because I love Joe Staten, you know what I mean? He's a beautiful artist. And I really yes. think that even though it's not a hundred percent you, it's still good. You know what I mean? And it and and I love it. It's and, very good because and and one of the reasons we wanted to work with Joe was because he does have a sense of cartooning. And Elfquest is most certainly cartooning. And so exaggerated features, stretch and squash and all of that, Joe was comfortable with that. He he's not a strict realist. And stretch and squash. I mean, Elastic Man. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, email. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, it, it, this is why his inking did work well with my artwork. I gave him the tightest pencils I could, but in many cases, uh, he did some finishes of his own that I thought were very good. Yeah, and um, and also it's funny because I. I, you know, I like, I think like when you go to high school or whatever, you know, I mean, I was like dealing with coming out of the closet, more interested with like going to clubs than collecting comic books and stuff. So I, I fell out of comics for a while. Yeah. I missed out on certain things like um, hidden years. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, we'll get this John Byrne thing out of the way. But um, I, I'm such a John <laughs> Byrne fan and I had discovered, you know, his story for hidden years. And I have to say, like, that's a per argument. You know, it's like everybody wants, you know, I know that uh, part of your intention after finishing ElfQuest is to sort of let other creators tell stories with your characters. Yes. And I think there is so much merit in that. And I think if anyone had any doubt, they should read that John Byrne story because mm -hmm. I think it fits within the parameters of what you, you try to do with ElfQuest just so well. Like, I just feel like it's a beautifully drawn and beautifully written story too. Like the, it, it just reminded me of what you bring to ElfQuest. It's just like, you know, aside from the beautiful art, I guess revisiting it, I was just reminded like the feels that it gives you, you know what I mean? Well, the, um, the trick of the storyline, which is Rayek keeps saying you haven't had enough, you know, and Cutter doesn't understand till the very end that what Rayek is saying is, look, I know you're pissed at me, take it out on me. I will, I will take it because you, you need to get this out of your system. It's the first time Rayek really ever thought about somebody over himself. And, and I think it's because Cutter was truly able to make Rayek see the pain, the anguish he had caused. And, and when, you can, when you can engage someone else's empathy like that, that's when the story can have a turning point. And so at the very end of the story, we realize that Rayek truly did let Cutter beat the tar out of him for Cutter's sake, not, not for anything to do with Rayek. And that elevated Rayek into hero status as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, yeah. especially if someone as prideful and arrogant yes. as him. Yeah, definitely. Yes. That was a definitely a great way to show his humanness without sacrificing yes. his integrity at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. And John Byrne was such did such a good job inking you. You know, you talk about Joe Staten and John Byrne, and they they both uh, have an element of cartooniness. Um, definitely. That, also, John had a feeling for fantasy that he didn't get to exercise very often. 
he, yeah. he uh, you know, he, of course, being the, the superstar that he was at the time in the 90s, to get to work with him at all was was great fun and a great privilege. But but John wanted to because there there's a side to his work that in conversations with him came out that he expressed he he wished he had more opportunity to do fantasy. And and this was the beginning of the birth of the idea of Hidden Years Nine and a Half and having him ink my work because I knew he would bring so much more to the original pencils than I had already put there. So um, he, he definitely expressed a different side of himself in Hidden Years Nine and a Half and the two-edged story he did for us. Yes, I love that. Um, uh, so how did, um, so you did one of my favorite things ever, because I love art jams, um, is <laughs> uh, She-Hulk number 50, where you, con <laughs> you contributed a page of She-Hulk in a very Elfquestian fashion. I think it was three. I think, I think, think it was, was a three-page short story, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 not, well, yeah. Now that you say it, um, yeah, I should have looked at it again. But um, how fun was that to do? Tremendous fun. Uh, it was. It was almost like payback. You know, he visited my world. I got to visit his world. And fair uh, enough. <laughs> he. The premise of the book was he was he was testing other artists to to see if uh, anybody could take over She Hulk for him it was it was of course just a fantasy premise but so uh many other artists worked on the book and contributed pages and the the gag was that he would find something wrong with everybody's contribution and that obviously he was the only one who could continue to draw she <laughs> and, and i think that she as a character was involved in the choice you know that right that he was almost the voice of John in that book, uh, making the decisions about why somebody's art didn't work. And right. <laughs> uh, the reason I think the reason my art didn't work was not not the drawing itself, but the completely elliptical word balloons oh. <laughs> <laughs> was the problem. <laughs> I know. I was thinking of that, too, because I was because you lettered the original Alquest, didn't you? Yeah. I was yeah, like, I'm, my... a, I'm a terrible letterer. Just terrible. No, I do. I disagree with you. I love oh. your lettering, and I think it looks perfect. On well, uh, it looks perfect the original. now because because Nate Piekos, who has been uh, <laughs> my letterer at uh, Dark Horse for ten years now, took my original lettering from the early issues of ElfQuest, and he took the best example of each letter and created an, an ElfQuest font. So now the lettering looks perfect. <laughs> but I, I was I was thinking of your discipline as an artist though because you're penciling inking lettering painting covers and back pages and you know uh writing and creating the story with Richard and uh mm -hmm. you know you had talked about deadlines and um it's funny because as an independent publisher you know you're sort of the boss so it's like you don't necessarily have an editor cracking the whip so what what how oh, is your... yes i did <laughs> oh yes i did for sure uh, as richard uh became more and more familiar with what it takes to be a publisher as well as an editor and his his editing and contribution to the story was absolutely vital you know he would he would take my raw script and make sure that it read smoothly and you know uh, our philosophy was always always use the artwork to show what is happening uh keep keep the words to a minimum and and show the reader what's happening that's that's been our approach but what i did write you know richard made sure it was smooth and um he once elfquest took off and it took off very fast and we weren't ready for it. We weren't ready for all of the demands because now we had to deal with distributors, 
comic book retailers, personal appearances, uh, all the various things that happen around something that gets successful very, very fast. Um, this, the 70s was a boom time for us because there were, as I said, very few independent comics on the shelves. And so the shelves were wide open for us and, and there was an audience that was hungry for fantasy and other things besides superheroes. So we caught lightning in a bottle. We just, we, we brought ElfQuest out at the right time. It took off very fast and we had to run to keep up with it. And one of the things that uh, we both became very insistent about, but R Richard was in charge of was our deadlines because suddenly we were working with other people, our printer, our distributor, and we had to work with their deadlines and what they needed and when. And, you know, if you, if you fall down on your end, if you're late, then it's like dominoes, you, you fall down and the rest of the dominoes fall down. And keeping to a schedule was extremely important to us. I mean, yes, we brought ElfQuest out three times a year. It was a tr tremendously labor intensive product. You know, it had to be written, penciled, inked, uh, uh, and uh, the, the covers painted. And it was 32 pages, which is a lot. You know, you, your nice. average comic is 20. So three times a year was what we could manage. And thank goodness our, our readers were willing to wait for that. But even so, at three times a year, there were so many things that had to be done ahead of time to, uh, in order to um, cooperate with the printer's schedule, the distributor's schedule, advertising, all these various things, all these various things. So, so how, uh, what, what, how, how did you work? Were you doing like uh, everything? Like, you know, like, did you just do the pencils first and then come and then like do everything one step at a time or? Oh, sure. Okay. Well, our way of, and you know, we've, we've explained this many times. Our way of working together is first, we would sit down and talk the story through. Then I would write a rough script. Then Richard would edit that. And then I would uh, do the pencils. And uh, Richard also uh, did uh, some supervision uh, on the artwork as well. Uh, his, his eye and his input for layout and, and camera angles and various things was very helpful, in the, uh, especially in the early days. Um, so uh, pencils, inks, uh, tones, whatever, uh, front and back covers painted, full paintings, full watercolor paintings, and uh, whatever advertising material, spot illos, that sort of thing. We were we were learning as we went, but but that's that was the basic process: is that we would we we would start out by talking the story through, then I would write it, he would edit it, I would provide the artwork then he would take the finished artwork and do what he needed to do to with the printer and the distributors and so forth. How was it seeing like it, it in print for the first time? Cause I've talked to artists who felt like it looked very different or something like that, or maybe they weren't satisfied or, uh, but I mean, ElfQuest looks great. So how did you feel when you had that copy in your hands for the first time? <laughs> It was our goal to make our first issue and second issue look great because we had had a bad experience with a kind of shady publisher who got the first edition, which was Fantasy Quarterly number one, uh, came out uh, in um, like late 77, early 78. I can't quite remember, but... but uh, we were very dissatisfied with the quality of that. And we wanted to make sure that what we brought out under the, our newly minted uh, company, Warp Graphics, we wanted to make sure it was head and shoulders above 
what had been brought out. And um, it was, and, and we established a level of quality that we never wanted to slip under. And, and so that was, that was the level we maintained. And thank you for saying it looked great. We, we really worked hard at that. I mean, it was beautiful. I was just looking at the first issue last night and you talk about like uh, clear storytelling and stuff. And I mean, it's just all there. I mean, you talk about lightning in a bottle. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just really just so breathtaking. As a matter of fact, it's funny because I guess I'm a dinosaur, but um, like looking at, I, I looked through, as my sister said to me recently about uh, watching um, a horror movie, um, I'm not mentally prepared to read the end of Elf Quest yet, <laughs> just because I think it would be so devastating for me. Um, but uh, well, I, we I, we want it we want it to be devastating, <laughs> but in but in an uplifting way. We we did it in a in a way that kind of makes sure once once you react to what happens after you've taken it in and processed it a little bit, it kind of makes your heart soar. S O A R, not S O. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because we talk about like fate and like um, yes. you know everything, like sort of the magic of the universe. And I just thought it was so cool that the last your your final issue, you and Richard's final issue, came out forty years to the day that the first issue did. I mean, that, that kind of gave you goosebumps. I mean, yeah. That was planned. We planned it with Dark Horse. Dark Horse was 100% behind that and they made it happen. I mean, that is so cool. <laughs> I just love that. That's just like such an interesting footnote, will be such an interesting footnote to the whole mm -hmm. ElfQuest experience. Full um, circle. We, it, yes. The final issue of Final Quest feels like full circle in every sense of the word because the very last page, when you finally do get around to reading it, you will find that the very last page absolutely reflects in a very positive way the very, very first page of ElfQuest. Yeah, that's that also made me happy to hear you say that uh, you were both um, not sad. You were very, like, happy and satisfied. And really? that is so good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is a long journey. I was also yes. thinking about that because you talk about like, uh, you know, Jack Kirby and how prolific he was. Yes. Um, I was like, my God, how many pages uh, of ElfQuest did, has Wendy Peeney drawn? I mean, it must be astronomical. Hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> hundreds. And yeah. that doesn't even, that doesn't even count, you know, some of your other side projects, you know, you're so mm -hmm. largely associated with ElfQuest, but it's like, you also did like this beautifully painted uh, Beauty and the Beast story that was, um, uh, you know, uh, a continuation of the television show. And, well, that, um, was a, that was a great honor because Ron Coslow, who's the creator of the show, didn't really know from comics and graphic novels at all. He wasn't familiar with the medium. This was in the um, this was in the nineties, um, late eighties, very early nineties, and um, he did not know from graphic novels. And when this was proposed to him through First Comics, he could not evaluate um, the script for a comic. Uh, it had to be written as a teleplay because that's what he knew. Mm -hmm. He knew how to. So, um, oh my goodness, I'm going back in my memory to to how I pitched my idea to how to first comics, and then what I was told I had to supply to Ron Coslow in order for Ron to even consider it, and I had to learn how to write in a teleplay format, and. <laughs> You know, it was, it was, you know, it, I must have really, really wanted the job because I did a lot to get the job. Um, and uh, I think my feeling about the show was that it was so unique and, and in a strange way, kind of fragile because something like Beauty and the Beast is just an absolute rarity on television. And Nothing like it has ever really been duplicated since. Um, the idea 
actually came from the um, Cocteau uh, 1940s black and white film as gorgeous impressionistic Beauty and the Beast film. Uh, and uh, Ron Coslow thought, well, what if this could be turned into a TV series? What if this relationship between Beauty and the Beast could be stretched out? What if we don't have, what if we don't get the prince? What if we just have the beautiful beast? <laughs> and just tell stories about him. And I was like right there because my least favorite part of the Beauty and the Beast myth is when we lose the beast and we get the dumb prince. <laughs> who wants that? <laughs> You know, I know what, what you, message is that sending? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the beast is never ugly. He's wonderful. He's other again, you know, the whole otherness thing. And um, Ron Coslow very much tapped into that feeling. So I wanted to support that. And I was excited about doing a graphic novel based on the show and the honor that I was given was to write an original story because Ron had originally felt that only adaptations of episodes should be done. Nothing new. Mm, I disagree with that. <laughs> well, absolutely. As you and, did too. <laughs> and apparently the, the treatment that I gave him for Portrait of Love, and then of course, Line of Beauty. You, Portrait, Portrait of Love did so well that when when Line of Beauty was proposed to him, he was just he was just very open to it. He's like, go for it, yeah. and and uh, so the the second one, the second graphic novel, was quite a bit easier to get going. I mean, the the art is uh, fully painted, correct? Yes, fully yeah. painted watercolors on on heavy grade watercolor pa paper. Yes, because I, I wanted the texture. And definitely uh, you pivoted your style for sure. I mean, away from ElfQuest. I mean, it obviously feels a lot less manga influenced. And oh, it was a little... tough. Yeah, yeah. It, it was quite a stretch. Um, I, told, I told everybody from the beginning that you're not going to get photographic likenesses from me because other, other graphic novels that had been done based on TV series or movies they tended to use movie stills as reference, you know? And so the likenesses were, were a little too photographic and kind of stiff. Mm -hmm. And if I retained any element of cartooning in doing Beauty and the Beast, it was in a sense of movement. I wanted to catch uh, the actors in the middle of an action rather than in a pose. If, if Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for but, sure. Yeah. So, um, so there, uh, what I'm pleased with is generally the likenesses are enough like the actors that, that they are highly recognizable, but also there's a, there's a lot of movement in the artwork a lot, and the painting and the brush strokes sort of enhance the movement of the characters. It is it was an action show after all. Yeah. So, so there had to be that sense of action. Um it's funny um speaking of beauty and the beast uh are you, <laughs> this is such a weird segue but are uh, are you a fan of Stevie Nicks at all? Oh well, she was just as, as much was, as anyone else <laughs> in the zeitgeist. I mean, she is certainly a fairy person. She always yeah. was, you know, she, she, she always was just had an aura of sorcery around her, you know, she just the because, whole bohemian gypsy look and all of that. <laughs> because <laughs> she, uh, she has a song called beauty and the beast based on the cocktail movie. Um, that is mm -hmm. like one of my songs. Like if, I, you know, I'm mm -hmm. like in a fetal position with my thumb in my mouth, like crying, like if I ever need <laughs> like therapy or whatever, but her, I love her lyrics so much, but like, uh, I was thinking about that reading some elf quest, just like your, your, you know, words are just so beautiful and so meaningful and feel so intentional. I thought, gosh, is Wendy Peeney the Stevie Nicks of comic books? Because like, you're this magical fairy creature with beautiful words and art to give to the world. And I was like, if if not, then they're definitely cut from the same cloth. So 
Well, yeah, I think you're <laughs> the first person ever to say that, and I'll I'll take it. What a high compliment! <laughs> you know, I often joke that all the elves look like uh, '80s an '80s hair band. <laughs> <laughs> I know they do for sure, and they do. So, it's funny because I was looking at a picture of Cutter, and um, you know how like you talk about like movie casting and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Billy, Billy from Stranger Things. Um, I don't know if you watch Stranger Things, but you know, he's like got the long hair and yeah. he's blonde and he's got like the abs and everything and like the piercing stare. And I was like, he would make a really good cutter. <laughs> I, th- I think there, there are young actors who, who could do our characters live action. Um, who knows? Who knows? I mean, it, it, we've been talking to Hollywood from day one. And option money is nice and all that. But uh, like we always say, we would rather have no movie than a bad movie. And so when, when Hollywood finally proves to us that they really, really get it and they're willing to go in the adult inclusive directions that ElfQuest goes, you know, because I, I think Hollywood still has an attitude towards fantasy that it has to be family friendly you know, and it has to be about good and evil and and it has to have all this duality associated with it. And that's not Elfquest. Elfquest, if if anything, is all shades of gray. Mm -hmm. No, it's, uh, and, and that's what made it able to be so inclusive because even our bad guys aren't 100% bad and our good guys are certainly not 100% good. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah everybody's kind of finding their way in elf mm-hmm. i know and that like speaks to the relatability of it you know mm-hmm. um uh speaking of villains um and also you had mentioned um erte as one of your artistic influences oh, and i love erte yeah. so much and before um you had mentioned that the thought occurred to me uh you know, now grown up with more a broader view of art and artists and stuff. I thought, wow, Winnow Will is very Erte and influence oh, in my mind. I mean, I can, oh, like, I can just, like, I almost want to see him paint her now. I mean, I realize that's impossible, but. <laughs> well, now, uh, now I'll tell you something. Uh, there was um, a gentleman uh, who, uh, a, a German in, uh, Oh gosh, why did his name fly out of my head? I'll give it to you later. Okay, no worries. <laughs> but but um, he interviewed Erte, and he happened to be an ElfQuest fan, and he do he knew that I was an Erte influenced artist. So during the course of his interview with Erte, he mentioned my name, and he had brought a couple of the comics with him, and showed. The, the master showed Erte my work. And uh, a, a, according to the interviewer, uh, Erte was able to see the influence. And he apparently remembered me and asked after me towards the end of his life. And, wow. and that, you know, just the idea that that connection out I of know. the blue got made is, you know, I love the fact that I've been able to thank all of my masters. I got, I certainly got to meet Jack Kirby when I was quite young before any of this got started. And I was able to, you know, thank him. And I don't think he got it. I don't think he understood. You know, <laughs> what is this young girl doing here? You know, <laughs> to him comics was all, you know, a very much a guy thing. Yeah. And, and he just, I don't, I just don't think he could mentally picture that a young girl could be as into his work as the boy fans he was used to but But, you were kind of an enigma in your time don't you think I mean (laughs) for sure uh speaking of Kirby uh the other thing that just put the biggest smile on my face was that uh you said your trolls are designed and dedicated to Jack Kirby and now I can't unsee it. And it just is so beautiful in my mind. Well, I just love the that. Feet. Especially. Oh, the yeah. Feet. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's big, clunky. 
the mm. feet and the and the broken toenails and fingernails are very Jack Kirby. <laughs> so off the top of your head, are are there any other nuggets like that um, flying through your art that you know um, that like tributes or homages to other artists? Like, because uh, you talk about Tezuko, like, but uh, that's more like just your beautiful illustrative style. Well, um, uh, as I was as I was talking about having met Kirby, I also got to meet Osamu Tezuka at uh, San Diego Con in 1980 or 81, uh, 81, I think. And um, it was an amazing experience. Um, he was not surprised by me because in Japan, women manga artists were pretty common even back then. So he was not at all surprised by me. And uh, he was, but he was surprised that an American cartoonist could be so, you know, able to draw his characters. And because I, I gave him, I gave him a drawing, uh, I gave him a drawing of uh, his uh, Monkey King character, uh, uh, his name is Sun Goku, but in the American translation, it's Alakazam the Great. So I gave him a drawing of Alakazam the Great and and um, Cutter. I also added Cutter to the drawing to show him how the um, the early Tezuka work came to influence my drawings. And um, my understanding was he kept the drawing that you know that it was sitting on his desk uh after that's, he passed away so that is so <laughs> gratifying and so yeah. re rewarding as an artist you know yeah. um it's it's things like that you know words are amazing and speak volumes and stuff but for 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 some special connection like that it just it's it, it's it, important to be able to say thank you you know uh and and that's one of the wonderful things about conventions especially big conventions is that you do have an opportunity if you take it to meet all of your heroes. Um, you know, I remember meeting Ray Harryhausen um, uh, and just being able to walk right up to him because for some reason there wasn't a line at his table at that point. And just being able to have a nice conversation with Ray Harryhausen, wow, you know. <laughs> yeah, mind blowing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when Tezuka came, to uh, San Diego Con, other um, famous manga artists also came. And uh, so I had a wonderful chance to talk with uh, Monkey Punch, who created um, uh, Lupin, his, his, uh, his very famous, you may not be familiar with this character, but if you like anime, you'll know Lupin. <laughs> I know, sadly, I, I, I mean, I don't dislike anime, but I'm not. Yeah. I, I think I like it better than I do since most of my favorite artists are hugely influenced by anime, so. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. Back in the 70s, when we brought ElfQuest out, most of the comics industry and most of comics fandom was not familiar with this type of drawing style. So ElfQuest looked very peculiar to mainstream comics professionals and fans. It was like, what is this? The guys all look like girls. They're all little people with great big eyes. What? What is this? You know, <laughs> these these are not six foot five muscular men bashing each other's brains out. These are what? <laughs> what right. am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> but but that that was the wonderful thing about the female audience that we garnered because they didn't ask those questions. They accepted it like that i know and you know women I guess, women get it right away yeah and i think i think like artists probably get it more too i mean you know you you see something i was just talking to uh, um someone you know recently uh, i'm so glad i didn't i didn't grow up uh with the internet because i'm so glad that there weren't constant voices there telling me which kind of art to like, which art is oh, good, yes. which art is bad. Yes. And just 
being able to walk in and see this flood of, you know, comic book covers and all these different artists and just like being drawn to them and just being excited and just yeah. like voraciously absorbing it without. And no one voices, telling you, you know? what to think about them. Yeah. No excellent. one telling you what their status is supposed to be or what scandal is associated with them or, you know, all of these things that, that make it a little poisoned, you know, nowadays. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was, things were much more innocent and clean back then before, before the internet. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you collect um, art from other artists? I would imagine you would to an extent. <laughs> do you have any Kirby originals? Did oh, Kirby ever draw? Did Kirby ever draw years ago, for you? <laughs> oh yeah, years ago, years ago. Um, Richard started up something called Wendy's Elf Book. Um, and, and that is, you can see pages from it uh, on elfquest.com, our, our website. Um, Wendy's Elf Book has uh, ElfQuest related drawings from every one you can think of. I got um, a very cute cartoon from uh, Doug Wildey. And he, he drew Johnny Quest and Race Bannon with pointed ears. Ah, uh, that's and so he, cool. And he has he has Johnny saying, "Wait a minute, I'm not Elf Quest, I'm Johnny Quest." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so cool. <laughs> Wasn't that cute? I love um, that. Yeah. yeah, there's um, a lot of love in that book. So. Do you? Um, uh, please tell me uh, you own all the original art from Elf Quest still. Oh, more than that, it is short of a nuclear explosion. It is as safe as can be because working with uh, Karen Green, who is the head archivist at Columbia U University Library, uh, the ElfQuest artwork for uh, uh, the classic quest and much more is now safe in the archives of Columbia University. Thank, so, I, thank God for that. <laughs> so people can people can make appointments and visit, visit the art anytime they want and study it. And uh, we invite people to do that. They're they're very very welcome to do that, so long as they wear gloves. Yes. When they, when they handle it. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, forming a relationship with Karen Green and the the library uh, archives at Columbia is one of the most beautiful and gratifying things that we've ever done because for a long time we were wondering what's going to happen to this work. We don't want to sell it. We don't want to split up these pages and sell them piece by piece. We can't do that. That would be like selling off our children. Right. So, so uh, <laughs> when Karen came to us and proposed, you know, would you like to donate it to our ar archives? Richard and I both heaved a huge sigh, sigh of relief because then we knew the artwork was going to be safe from fire, preserved, blood, taken care and, of, and yeah, and preserved carefully. Now, um, I don't, and I know you did like a similar sort of thing, but um, I'm a huge fan, and I would really love to see one, um, like an ElfQuest artist edition. Is that anything you've ever thought? Well, about there are or? three. Uh, oh, John, okay. John Flesk, Flesk Publications, did three huge art books. I don't know if you're aware of these, but just look up Flesk Publications, ElfQuest, and, you know, you will see. Um, some, I, I believe they are still available. I think they're all still in print. Uh, Dark Horse Comics also did a huge art book of... Um, the, uh, the first issue of ElfQuest, all of the original art, full size, with all of the pencil marks and mistakes and everything. Uh, it's uh, it's the closest I, thing to handling the original art you can do. The, I, I always say that when I talk about artist editions, and now I have my work cut out for me finding these. Um, you talk about how ElfQuest fans sort of uh, support each other and help each other out and take care of yes. each other. So after my video, um, uh, you know, because I, I think I had mentioned uh, wanting to see like, you know, the actual art or whatever. Some, you know, people were quick to point those uh, that there yes. was actually an art book that had the original art in there. So I'm definitely we, we on do, eBay search right now. Yeah, 
<laughs> we do continue to have a, a whole lot of original art here in our, original art here in our own files. Um, but uh, uh, quite a bit of it is at Columbia and more of it will go to Columbia as the years pass. But um, yes, if you ever come to visit us, you can see a whole lot of stuff that nobody else ever gets to see. <laughs> yeah, one of my friends actually said that there's uh, some sort of uh, show going on. Um, maybe, maybe it's the one you're talking about. Someone invited him to go look at original Alquest art. And I was like, you bastard. I'm so jealous. <laughs> well, get yourself to Columbia University in New York. I will. I will now. And I will. I mean, how could I not? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that must be what he's talking about. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. I'm so glad you had the presence of mind to do that. You know, it's like I always hear these horror stories about how awful original old original comic book art was treated and how it's just like yeah. out there. And like when IDW does these artist editions, there's always like a call to arms to sort of, you know, get people to donate for scanning purposes you know like yes. their original art and um yes. you know now that everything's digital uh you know we're not gonna be able to even have these artist editions to have you ventured into digital at all do you work digitally i i've been digital working digitally since uh, the early 2000s um final quest uh, the discovery searcher and the sword it's all digital Oh, when, wow. when we were when we were uh, uh, contracted with DC Comics to do the the manga sized editions plus to recolor the classic quest for a four volume archive edition, and I really wanted to do that because I wanted to do the definitive coloring. All of that work was digital, and that was back in two thousand four. I think the relationship lasted till about 2007. And um, then Mask of the Red Death from uh, 2007 through uh, 11, I, I did fully digital uh, graphic novel, 400 pages uh, based on Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death. And then back to ElfQuest and onward, soldiering on. It's it, and the wonderful thing about working digitally uh, is that it's enormously forgiving. Right makes makes it much easier to read uh, to meet deadlines. Um, you don't. It's true. You don't have the original drawings and paintings to hold in your hands, but you do have work that um, shines in its own way. And I hope, I hope that eventually digital artwork will come into its own and, and receive the kind of respect that the hand, hand drawn and painted stuff does. I think, I, I mean, I think that it, it definitely does have its marriage merit. And I, like yeah. as an artist myself, I mostly work, um, uh, you know, uh, digitally now, just because it's so convenient and mm -hmm. less messy and everything like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, as an artist, you do get the itch to pick up a pencil and, you know. Yes, definitely. Um, um, it's not a skill you should ever lose. It, you know, it, it, there's, there is something magical about, about the relationship of you, the brush or pencil and the paper and just making it all happen right there. Uh, digital is a process. It's done in layers. And uh, as I said, it's very forgiving. You, If you don't like something you've done, you go back through your history to the point where the mistake was made. And you don't have to worry about that mistake. You can just proceed from there. That's a blessing. You know, I've had instances where I've spilled a bottle of ink on a page that I was almost finished with. That's heartbreaking. <laughs> and then, you know, and there's no rescuing it. You have to start I know, all where do you go from there? Well, first you cry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you somehow pull yourself together and start all over again. But, but again, with digital, you, you never run into that. You can, of course, erase accidentally hours and hours of work. And that will also make you cry. So you have to be very, very careful to save your work. 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. So. Yeah. Uh, well, it's funny because, uh, you know, in, in the in my little research, I, I did come across the Mask of the Red Death and looked at some of the oh. art through there. And it's beautiful. And I, I did. I had no idea it was all digital. So, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> that was how epic was that? My, and the and the art is very beautiful. And it does definitely feel a lot more uh, manga influenced than ElfQuest. Well, it's For like sure. I wanted I wanted it to look very much like uh, as if each panel had had been a frame in a lavish anime movie. It it, it is a tribute to uh, boys love anime uh, and uh, dark horror, erotic, um, all all of the subject matter that that you find in so many. Um, uh, very, very elaborate manga in Japan, um, more, from, more from the 90s. But um, we are working right now on bringing Mask into the uh, 20, 2020s <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, as I was working on it, I realized, my gosh, this thing is a musical. This, this thing reads and plays like a dark musical thriller, like Phantom of the Opera or Sweeney Todd or Jekyll and Hyde. It's, it's got that same vibe to it. So I became obsessed with the idea that this thing is gonna be a musical. And uh, over the course of years from 2011 till now, uh, I was very fortunate to encounter talent in the theater world to help me with that. And uh, especially Gregory Neighbors, who is the composer of the score for the Mass Musical, which is finished now. Wow. We have, we have a full score. Uh, and uh, so the graphic novel, I've, I have revisited the graphic novel and rearranged the artwork and added new artwork to better reflect what the musical is like. Because the graphic novel was really dark. <laughs> <laughs> and the characters were really mean to each other <laughs> and uh, uh, the audience of a musical doesn't want to sit through two hours of characters being mean to each other they they want to root for the the heroes and heroines so we 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 changed mask to be more romantic rather than more just uh, grim <laughs> horrific stuff and um, I love it uh, you know, it's it it's uh, it's everything I wanted it to be and more on account of the music. Oh, good. And, it's see, so, you are the Stevie Nicks of the comic books. Now you're making musicals. <laughs> well, music has always been an integral part of my work from the beginning. I always have music on when I work and I try to find program music or movie scores that will inspire me for uh, certain scenes. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, music can definitely help you through deadlines, through yes. uh, artistic uh, problems. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The when right I was music. working on Mask, I had Enigma on a lot. Oh, wow. En Enigma. <laughs> No wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't wonder, do you? <laughs> no, it, took, it definitely took you to those dark places for sure. Yes. <laughs> um, Another video I watched um, from sci-fi was you just, um, and I love these videos because, you know, I think about like when I was little and, you know, being the best artist in class is, is such, you know, a relatable for probably every artist, you know, but having ki other kids, you know, ask you to draw things and stand around and watch them draw. So it yeah. was really fun to watch you draw Cutter. Um, there was a video where you're drawing Cutter with a Sharpie and, um, uh, you make the comment that, you know, because uh, you didn't draw like any underdrawing with pencil first or whatever. And you said that people are so amazed how you can just draw a cutter, but you've been drawing him for 40 years. So, of course, you could be able to draw him. But I was just thinking about, you know, the spontaneity of art. And I feel like, you know, learning how to draw like just you know, from your own um, desire to draw, you don't know about underdrawings or like sort of forming the stuff. So when we're first drawing, we are just drawing like straight to the drawing. That and is so very true. You know, you learn te technique along the way. And I, I am not an academic. I'm not a art student. I, um, 
I actually got an F in painting in college. <laughs> 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 but I've, um, it, I've, so I am entirely self-taught. So technique along the way came from reading and but mostly just practice, practice, practice. That's uh, ama like, amazing to hear uh, that you got an F in painting, first of all, and um, oh, also that's that yourself. because my teacher had <laughs> very definite ideas about what painting was, and I didn't agree with that and went my own way, which is what I've always done. I'm, I'm very difficult to tell no. You can't really <laughs> tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> thank god for that but it's funny because with your you know a lot of uh, times i'll see a comic book artist and their um art, their their pencil and ink work looks very different from their paintings i think of someone yes. like an extreme example is someone like simon bisley but um yes. with you with your art i thought like if you look at the covers of elf quest and compare it to the interiors it just matches so well like it's just it's kind of amazing how adept I've, you were at capturing the same sort of style in two totally different media. You know what I mean? Um, yes. Thank you so, for noticing that. Yeah, I just, I just love your art so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, even as you uh, pencil and ink in black and white, very often you can picture it in color. Uh, that's why when we got to coloring ElfQuest, I had already envisioned in my mind a lot of the um, tones and lighting effects and things like that, that I wanted. Uh, I was very dissatisfied with the Dawning Starblaze uh, books. As a matter of fact, I, I cried when the first one came oh, out. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> because it looked like a gumball machine to me. Oh, <laughs> it, was just, it was bright. <laughs> it was very, and well, Donning Starblaze did not support the use of high quality materials. They just they just wanted to get this thing done. And yeah. you know, to their credit, it had never been done before in America. So they they too were starting from scratch. It was the first time they'd ever tried anything like that. And fortunately, even though garish as they were, the Donning Starblaze editions sold like hotcakes. Yeah. And so that told us that that was a direction we could continue to go in. And that's another thing I'm looking forward to is I really want to get Siege at Blue Mountain and uh, Kings of the Broken Wheel and some of the other canonical black and white ElfQuest storytelling colored uh at the level that we did for the dc archives yeah uh, i'm really looking forward to getting to that at some point well i guess now i know why i preferred the black and white versions to the star ones <laughs> <laughs> but i i have to ask um because um, i was excited just because of course you know uh elf quest whatever but like when uh marvel's epic like reprinted um yeah uh elf quest i mean that was major in a way because you know it brought elf quest to the mainstream via marvel it but sure I'm, did. I'm wondering how you felt about like the coloring and the printing on those and loved that run it. yeah loved it. we knew exactly what to expect yeah and there were several colorists that we worked with and and they they used pre-existing colors as a guideline and uh, we knew it was going to be the old fashioned, you know, what do they call it? The, the dot matrix. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we were excited about that. We, you know, I suppose it brought out in our hearts the 16 year old comic book collectors who just loved that look to begin yes. with. Yes. Uh -huh. and, so, and so we loved the Marvel re, uh, reprints, uh, it gained us an entirely new much larger audience and of people who had never heard of ElfQuest before. It it's, put it put us in the spinners and the grocery stores and the comic book racks and uh it put us in places we hadn't been before to sell. I know it was it was really fun uh, for me when it came out. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um 
so aside from uh, your little guest appearance in She-Hulk, have you it, had you have any other presence like in mainstream DC or Marvel comic books? I can't sure. recall. There were little invitations that came along all the time. I did a, a couple of spot elos for DC in one of their uh, character encyclopedias. I um, I did a short Superman story uh, based on Lois Lane for them in one of their uh, Superman anthologies. I did uh, a, I, I did a story uh, involving Triton the Inhuman for Marvel. How cool. It, 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 was, it was an anthology called um, Unlikely Heroes. And so, so I said, well, let me tell a story about Triton. He's got pointed ears and I've always loved him. Yeah, he's <laughs> cool. I love Triton. So, <laughs> again, another character who the Inhumans were my favorite Marvel characters because they were the most otherly of all the Marvel characters. And I loved the mythology that Jack Kirby built up around them. Yeah, for sure. I know. I And also, I, yeah, speaking of mythology, I mean, how epic in scope, um, like, did you say there's at least 700 characters in ElfQuest? In ElfQuest, yes. That is insane. <laughs> yes, it is insane. I, I, mean, I like to I like to joke that if I knew I had, was going to be drawing the darn things for 40 years, I would have designed them all bald and naked. <laughs> That's true. Like what, what on earth? Like, it's not like they don't, it's not just like one of them that has like this gorgeous lush hair. It's like a lot of them, like seriously. I know all there's of them, so, all of them. You I know, know it's, I, I think of an artist like uh, George Perez who um, loved to, uh, you know, I loved his costume designs. And he said that, uh, you know, especially with someone like a character like Starfire, like nobody could draw like him because they they would either like forget one armband or something yes. like that. Um, do you? He, he did have a fashion sense. He did have a great sense of designing costumes. He also had infinite patience that I do not have for crowd scenes. I loathe crowd scenes. And I had to do so many of them because we have these... 700 characters who all need to get their due so, <laughs> but I do not have George Perez's patience for for crowd scenes yeah but I can think of a few crowd scenes um well um the John Byrne or the story where John Byrne inked you there's this great double page spread with all yes. the I think it's all the trolls sitting around I was like I was like blown away when I turned the page and saw that. I was like, that is so cool. Well, you need establishing shots. This was the first time we had ever seen this section of the Troll Kingdom. You know, we had we had shown other sets like King Grey, Grey Monk's throne room and sets like that. But um, but this arena was something that we had never shown the fans before. So it had to be thought out in detail how would it be set up how would how would the trolls design their own arena for events that they would hold that no elf had ever seen i mean this was all so unique because this was the first time that elves had ever been invited down to participate in a an event in the troll arena you know it was bringing the two groups together uh in a common uh, for a common show, <laughs> the tr the trolls were just regarding it as a big show. They were just lapping it up, you know. They they loved to watch a couple of elves trashing each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Do you still draw regularly, or um, are there, there like non elf quest projects that you've been wanting to do that you still may do or? Just about everything I've done this year has been in the cause of promotional work or supplemental work to what we were involved when, in with the um, ElfQuest audio movie. And uh, the, uh, the, the goodies that we had to provide uh, to the Kickstarter uh, contributors, um, a lot of it involved new artwork from me. Um, also, there was the completion of uh, Stargazer's Hunt, which is the last 
or I should say the most recent work that I've done for Dark Horse Comics. Um, and I did that with the incredible assistance of Sunny Strait on the colors and some of the finishes for the artwork. So um, it's been a very busy year, a very tumultuous year. And most of it has not been spent in doing anything comics related. It's mostly been promotional artwork related. Also prints, um, portraits of the characters and scenes for a new relationship we have with a group called Streamily. And, and we do online um, appearances every couple of months or so and people can buy the prints and see us sign them on camera. And that's a lot of fun to do because it's it's a way of interacting with the fans when you can't attend every convention. So uh, the fans can see us do this live uh, streaming on Instagram and uh, they can interact with us and act que ask questions. And it's it's almost like doing a signing at a convention. Um, it's it's so great to see how like uh, positive and like just I you I can tell you have this real sense of sort of responsibility and sort of honoring your fan base like Definitely. you just I mean I I just imagine that especially with you know a genre like this you know the Elf Quest fans have to be voracious you know um, they are. They really let us know what they think and what they want. And since the advent of the internet, and especially these days, uh, it, it, it can be very intense. <laughs> yes, for sure. I know it's weird how things are now. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, imagine Jack Kirby, like, <laughs> having to, like, manage, like, an Instagram account or, you know, Jack Kirby on Twitter or something like that. I mean... It's just so weird. Like, I, I feel like in a way it's not fair. You know, it's like you almost have to be like sort of this PR machine on top of being yes. an artist. And yes, because because you see um, so many people are working online these days. So many people are getting their independent comic ideas off the ground by putting them up online as web comics. This is how a lot of people uh, getting their work up as web comics or showing their work on Instagram um, uh, or um, the art. There's another one. Uh, I'm sorry, that flew out of my head. Uh, the art. Um, well, never mind. There, there are so many ways that people are getting their art up online and uh, developing an audience that way. In fact, we did that with Mask of the Red Death back in 2007, when the internet was by no means what it is today. Um, we started Mask of the Red Death as a, a semi-animated webcomic and built an audience for it that way, uh, you know. Uh, people found it. Uh, we had, I think, up, by the time it was done, we had upwards of 5 million views. Uh, so getting started online is probably one of the best ways to get started nowadays. It's very, very hard. It's so different nowadays to uh, in the attempt to launch an independent comic. Um, gosh, I, I, I wouldn't know how to begin to advise someone if they wanted to self-publish their own comic idea right now. Uh, it's so different and the competition is so extreme that I would think the better, the better thing to do is not take the risk of involving yourself with a printer and a distributor and all that, but rather use what the internet is, is good for in that sense and get your work known there first um for, for whatever that advice is worth <laughs> <laughs> i know i mean you know there's a lot of like kickstarter comic books and i think that's great in a way because you know it it helps get comic books made that might not get made otherwise yes um but on on the other hand 
as I said to someone recently, I feel like it, it, it also kind of limits your audience because then it's only available to the people who participated in the crowdfunding. Yes. So, but you know, if it, or, if it gets you know, it, if it's popular or not. enough. Yeah. yeah. If you can, if you can, for example, create a website around your work as we did for mask, um, you know, and that takes a lot, a tremendous amount of effort in itself and a certain amount of expense. But if you can create a, a, a staging area, a website around your uh, independent comic idea and then launch it there, then people have a place to go. And word of mouth and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram all helps draw people to your website. Um it's, well, it's one way to do it anyway. And then once you get the work done, then you can think about getting it printed. You can, you can go to comic book conventions and actually meet publishers and editors that you can inform about your completed web comic and see if you can form some kind of a relationship that would actually enable it to get printed and published. Yeah, I think I think it takes talent, luck, <laughs> oh. and, ten- and tenacity. Tenacity. You have you have to be passionate about your idea, because the roadblocks, the frustrations, the um, the sheer exhaustion of doing the work, you have you have to be able to stick through stick to it through thick and thin. You really do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess it helps uh, that you've had such a wonderful partner um, oh. throughout this whole experience and journey. One of the things that just melted my heart was when you talked about going for long drives to discuss um, the, you know, the directions of the characters and the stories yes. and stuff. And I just imagine you guys like in your car, just destination unknown, just trying to like work out all the details. And I thought, you know, that's like when the real magic happens and it's like that's like so great that you know that was like the beginning of it all like uh and I know you probably answered this a million times but just really quickly like um was it always going to be ElfQuest like or did did you just know you wanted to do a comic book and that's what you came up with from your you mean the title uh not necessarily the title just the the subject Oh, well, again, we've we've talked about this a lot uh, through our careers that um, I've always been a storyteller. And from from way back in my childhood, the stories that I tended to tell were about groups of. Let's just call it tribe, you know, whether they were tribes of fairies or tribes of of people from other planets or little insect people. They were always tribes um, coming together as family, coming together in in mutual support through some kind of crisis and and trying to find uh, a safe haven. The, the, The characters I tended to create were always on a quest for home. They were always trying to find where they really belonged in either the world or the universe. And so this was precisely the story that I sat down to tell Richard in 1977, only by then the ElfQuest characters were pretty fully developed in my head and I presented them to him and he fell in love right away. But we talked a lot about whether to present it as the idea for a movie script or prose novels or how do you tell this story? And we ultimately decided to present it as a comic because we wanted the benefit of both the artwork and the storytelling together. You know, by then I had designed a lot of the characters and we could see that they could they could definitely carry a comic story. So it's yeah, it's funny. Um, you talk about like the just the format of comic books. It's like it, it, I don't think people realize what a magical format comic books are. Um, you know, uh, in recent years, I feel like comic books 
have tried to sort of um, mimic movies, like try to be yes. more cinematic. Yes. You know, we've seen. Well, that only makes sense, doesn't it? Because, um, you know, the Marvel and DC movie universes have both been around for a, at least a decade now, if not more. Right. And this is how, I think this is how a lot of people are even just getting introduced to comics is through the movies now. So they they think of comics cinematically and it, it, it used to be that you wanted movies to reflect the comics. Now, I think a lot of people want comics to reflect the movies. <laughs> you, know, you know, the movie becomes the first love and then you go find the com comic as supplemental material. I think that's a lot of people's experience nowadays. That is true. And um, mm. the, only, the only issue I have with uh, trying to be more cinematic is when uh, we see like the disappearance of things like thought balloons and captions yeah. and sound effects. I feel like people yeah. don't know that that's like part of the secret sauce of what makes comics so exciting. You know what I mean? Like, like when the characters are talking on the cover or something, I don't know. It's just fun to me. And I just uh, hate to see those kinds of things disappear. Well, the more old fashioned format of uh, dialogue on the covers and, and uh, thought balloons and things like that. Oh, come on in. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> is, is that your, uh, your uh, other that half? That was my other half. Yeah, he uh, has an errand to run. Wow. Um, but anyway, um, where were we? <laughs> oh, we were just talking about the uh, like the the format of comic books and how they're becoming more cinematic and less comic yes. booky in a way. But I guess, like you said, it's sort of a sign of the times. You know, I mean, you know, t sitcoms don't look like Leave It to Beaver anymore. So it's <laughs> the evolution of comic books, I guess. Yeah, um, whether or not <clears throat> uh, youngsters, teenagers of today, would love thought balloons and and the things that we all have a fond fondness for that we grew up with i don't know you know maybe they would think it's uh you know this is funky i don't I'm, that doesn't look right i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a whole new world um, it is a whole new world and there are there are whole new idioms and means of expression now that didn't exist before and um keeping up with it staying staying contemporary um being able to read your audience and know who they are and and who you're aiming your stories at i think i think if you want to stay in the business of comics you really have to stay on top of of what um younger people are thinking nowadays because i really do think younger people are your are your contemporary audience now I agree. But I, and, you know, I, I mean, I feel like they kind of always have been as far as comics. I mean, I, I you know, there's a joke, there's, they always joke that, you know, all, the only people who read comic books are, you know, white dudes over 40. <laughs> but, well, there certainly is a segment of that. Yeah, that That's is, absolutely true. <laughs> but, but I didn't, you know, start out as a white dude over 40. I was, you know, like four <laughs> years old when I wrote my first comic. It's just a, mm -hmm. a lifelong love of comic books that, um, you know, and that's kind of why I do my channel. And I'm so glad to bring on someone like you because I feel like I'm sort of giving back to the industry in a way, you know what I mean? Or at yeah. least give, giving current or future audiences, you know, the knowledge of what went into making comics and things like that. And uh, I have to uh, ask you really quickly, just because uh, not only are you an art and comic pioneer, but you're also a cosplay pioneer as well. Yes. Um, famously uh, doing Red Sonia back in the day. Yes. I was so thrilled to find that clip of you on the Mike Douglas show. Yes. Like how amazing was that? And it's like, I was like, you go Wendy Peeney, like so young <laughs> and so beautiful and just coming out in that red Sonia costume with the biggest smile on your face. And I just thought that is iconic right there. Well, I loved the character and um, 
I shared uh, Frank Thorne's passion for uh, the spirit of the character. Um, there were so many ways to identify with her. Feminism back then, uh, of course, was in its early stages. Uh, and feminism, a lot of it tended to be based on anger. And Red Sonia was an angry female character. She, you know, she had been horribly abused and the, the warrior that she was came out of horrible abuse and tragedy. And these were things that I could identify with uh, due to struggles in my own life. And so the anger, the, the, the desire to, you know, get a hold of an audience and say, you know, this is how it is. You, you think you know how it is? No, this is how it is. Red Sonia was a character you could do that with. And um, sure, it offended some people who thought it was uh, inappropriately rude or, <laughs> you know, that a woman shouldn't be talking like that. But those were the 70s. And women were starting to be rude and angry and out in the open with it. And I was, I was just one of the people in that category. Did you ever have the opportunity to draw Red Sonia? Oh, sure. Um, not, not the comic. I, I, my first professional work was I wrote an issue of Red Sonia for Marvel. Oh, wow. How and cool. That's, yeah. Uh, Frank Thorne and Roy Thomas invited me to do that. I was very grateful uh, for the opportunity <clears throat> and uh, enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it very much. And that's how I broke into comics professionally. Well, I think Dynamite has the license now, and I would love to see a Wendy Peeney Red Sonia variant covered. Not gonna happen. <laughs> Never. Okay. No, Sonia is Sonia is. I I love a her. Footnote I bless in her. Past. her. <laughs> She's very much in the past, and the direction they've taken her now is not a direction I want to go. Enough you know, said. <laughs> you know, I don't think I need to say more. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, uh, that is so amazing. Uh, are you going to be involved with the aesthetic of the musical or are they just basing it uh, solely on your artwork? Am, am I going to be involved with the what? Like the designs and costume designs and things like that for the musical? Of oh, for Mask? I have yeah. no idea. I have no yeah. idea. Right now, um, I think that the way Mask is going to uh, get seen in the early stages might be very much like what happened to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. You know, uh, stripped down, minimalist uh, performances with a minimal cast, um, the use of projections rather than sets, you know, uh, lighting and such to create the mood, but nothing elaborate. I mean, the ultimate dream, of course, would be phantom of the opera level, but but that requires millions of dollars and it requires yeah. producers that would believe in the property enough to to provide that. So we're going to start small and and just make sure it gets seen and most especially heard because the music is fabulous. And I think once the music gets heard, people are just going to crave, you know, oh, I want the album, you know. And, and I, I think that would bring the interest of producers towards uh, more elaborate staging. And whether they stick to my designs in the comics or not, I don't care. Yeah. You know, just so it's mask. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you had talked about, um, are there any more Elfcrest projects by other creators in the works at this time? I'm going to leave that for another conversation. You got it, you got and it. Right now we're wrapping up this year, which has been absolutely loaded. Yeah. And of course we're talking about what uh, 2023 and beyond is gonna look like, but there's nothing firm enough to talk about right, right. now. Mm -hmm. So, so um, 
Is there any other uh, thing you want to share with us before we oh, wrap this we've, up? We've or? covered far more ground than I expected we were going to. <laughs> okay. Well, I, so. you know, I, I felt like I won the lottery, so I had to make sure I maximized my time with you, you know, just take a little bit of your essence for the time that we're together. And yeah. you just warmed my heart, made my day. Um, I, it's funny cause I told my cousin and my sister, I was like, you're never going to believe this. I am going to be interviewing the creator of ElfQuest. And they were both very excited for me because they knew of how obsessed I was with, uh, ElfQuest when I was little. And I'm so glad it, thanks to John Byrne, it, you know, it reminded <laughs> me of how much I love ElfQuest and I'm definitely yeah. seeking out those art books and, uh, probably will be reviewing them as well. So um, oh. I look forward to that. And um, it was such like, I cannot thank you enough. Like you are just, you, you know, I've never read a bad thing about Wendy Peeney. You just are so beloved in the industry. And so many of my favorite creators seem to really hold uh, as you used to hold a special place in their heart. And I just think you're amazing. And what you and Richard have done is just a blessing to not just the comic book industry, but to the world. And I thank you for that. Oh, how beautiful. You, you have proved to be as nice and wonderful to talk to as I thought you might be. Uh. <laughs> and so I thank you for a very enjoyable conversation. And we touched on things that I don't usually get to talk about in interviews. So I really enjoyed that. Oh, good. I'm glad. I well, you, you. It, I, I didn't, I wanted you to be recognized uh, for your art because I feel like, mm. you know, uh, there's an artist behind, oh, blessed. you know mm. what I mean? There's a person yes. who made that happen. There's, you know, and that person is you and, you are so talented and uh, thank you again. <laughs> oh, well, it was an absolute pleasure. I hope we can do it again. And um, uh, I'm very curious as to your reaction when you finally do read the final quest. Okay. Yes, maybe th that'll be our follow up. My reaction All right. to uh, <laughs> the final quest. Sounds good, Wendy Peeney. Thanks so much for talking to us. Everybody, uh, please, everybody, I beg you, if you're an ElfQuest fan, uh, seek out um, Wendy Peeney's other projects, too, because they're definitely worth the look. Mask of the Red Death, Beauty and the Beast, She-Hulk number 50, what have you. There is something for everyone out there. And there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And and uh, we'll just keep keep on keeping on, Wendy Peeney, because the world loves you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, Richard and I fully intend to keep on keeping on. And what shape that takes, stay tuned. Yes. And that's the perfect way to end. So thank you so much. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to edit out the rest of this, but I just wanted to like formally say goodbye so that um, right. <laughs> you're so, I love you so much, Wendy. Thank you so oh. much. That is, uh, so, oh, one thing I forgot to mention um, is that uh, I also thought it was very cool how you had mentioned that Boris Vallejo gave you the awesome advice to have a very distinct uh, signature so yes. that people recognize your work because it's my yes. huge pet peeve when I look at art and there's no signature. And yes. like, you know, as an artist, I guess credit is like so important to us. You know what I mean? Yes, it's Boris an, taught me, keep, you know, make it very simple, make it iconic so that people instantly recognize that it's you. Yes. And, uh, you know, he has Boris. I mean, nobody else does it the way he does. So... Uh, so I followed his lead and created something that people instantly recognize. But thank you for and doing I do. that. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. All right, Wendy, I won't steal any more of your time, but I will. Uh, well, hopefully... we did almost an hour and a half here. Wow. <laughs> and it went by yeah. like that. <laughs> it did, didn't it? It did. I could talk to you all day, but I won't. Oh. <laughs> I hope we get to meet in person someday. Oh, that would be great. I would love to. Um, did yeah. you guys do conventions a lot or? Uh, well, we are really going to be picky about what we do next year. Uh, San Diego Con is looking like a possibility. So I know you're based in California. So mm -hmm. if, you, uh, 
make it to San Diego that, that there's a possibility there? Well, I would, I would, I, I used to go every year to San Diego because uh, I uh, had friends who worked in publicity and I would always ride their coattails and um, mm. it, it feels like such a racket now, <laughs> but mm. I would definitely, I would definitely go to see you for sure. And hopefully, or if not to promote uh, some of my own work. So, <laughs> well, yes, there you go. And I think COVID reset everything. And I think if you went to San Diego next year, for example, you would find that the the people who are in charge are the people who have been in charge for decades, Jackie Estrada, um, and, and um, they have managed to keep the flavor of it. And, and because of COVID, attendance is a little bit down. So you, I, I think maybe you might find it a little bit more like you remember next yeah. year. So that's the silver lining to the COVID yeah. cloud. <laughs> yeah, if there is one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to All say right. goodbye. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you again. Goodbye. And Take care. It was Guys, a pleasure. It was a pleasure for me too. Thank you so much, Wendy. Have a great day. Okay. All right. You too.